I'm really pleased to be joined uh, on Not The Andrew Marr Show uh, by Deepa Driver. Deepa has been busy uh, this week at the court, the Royal Courts of Justice, as we've had uh, the Julian Assange extradition final appeal hearing. Um, how are you doing, Deepa? Are you knackered? Yeah, I've had a few nights when I've gone to bed at about between midnight and 3 a.m. and woken up again at half five. But um, it's, you know, one of the nice things about this time around was for the first time, I finally got confirmed access. And um, although it came very late in the process, thanks to uh, the powers that be, I was treated really well by the people who were dealing with me in court. It was such a knowing that you've had a bad night, you know, and then you've got to sit for about eight hours in court. Um, you just worry that you won't be able to do it justice. But I really felt I, um, yeah. So I, I filled a whole notebook, Crispin. So yeah. my notes filled a whole notebook from, I took an empty notebook when I went in the first day. And by the end of the second day, I had pages and pages of notes. Wow. That's incredible. That's uh, that's very detailed, obviously. So I don't know if we can, we can get all your notebook out on this, uh, this interview. That might be a long, long interview. Um, that's no, right. It's it. So it was two days this this uh, hearing, and we had lots of people outside. I turned up on the second day for a bit. Um, there were people drumming and and uh, making lots of noise. They had a they had a stage. People speaking as well at certain points. Um, yeah. lots of celebs were there. But then we we come to the 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 crux of it, which is what actually went on in the court. Um, and there's a lot outside the court, but what actually went on in the court, um. I can't really ask any more simply than what actually happened. Okay, so as if you haven't been following this, the two days were what we call renewals hearings. Essentially, what that means is um, Julian, as you know, won at the at the lowest court, at the magistrate's court stage, and he won on the basis of the fact that, not on the basis of press freedom related considerations, not on the basis that there had been war crimes committed, not on the basis that his lawyers had been spied upon or that the United States had plotted to assassinate him. None of those things were considered. What he won on was that he was too ill to be sent to the United States, especially given the US prison conditions. So that was what he won on at the lowest stage in very simplistic terms. What the US then did was something very naughty. They put in something called diplomatic assurances. Now, these aren't worth the paper they're written on. You, you might as well use them in the loo because they cannot be enforced. So they put in these diplomatic assurances that said, oh, we won't hold him in this particular ADX unless there is any conduct that we discovered subsequent to this assurance that we um, that we want to put him under ADX for. Similarly, we won't put him under what they call special administrative measures. And these the Center for Constitutional Rights in the U.S. has called these the darkest corner of the earth. And that's because when you're under SAMS, even your lawyers cannot talk to you without the FBI present. Right. So people are held in disgusting and horrible conditions. So they so the U.S. put in these assurances and our high court judges accepted those assurances. And so, you know, Preeti Patel agreed to extradite. Right. Julian's lawyers then put in what is called a cross appeal. All the things that they lost at the first magistrate's court stage, they then came back and said, we'd like to appeal that. And we'd also like to appeal the Secretary of State's decision. When they put in that, those appeal documents, appeals in the UK are not, uh, are not guaranteed. You have to ask for permission to appeal first. So they put in the papers for the permissions. The judge waited, whatever, nine months and came back and said, hey, your, your papers were too long. Here's a three page judgment, which basically says your papers are too long. And I don't think you're bringing anything new to the table. So that's a single judge on paper. And this is a judge who's previously talked about how he enjoyed being a lawyer defending the intelligence agencies. So that is what it is, <laughs> but you know, obviously, um, different lawyers defend different people and we can't equate them with their clients, but that's what that judge said. You then have an opportunity to say, 
hey, I don't agree with the paper, paper decision, on paper decision, we would like to have our day in court to ask for permission. And that's what happened over the, the two days that just have been. Right. On day one, you had Julian's lawyers. On day two, you had the US represented by the CPS and plus a little bit of rebuttal of the US position right at the end, an hour by Julian's team. Very important to say, because people didn't get permissions, uh, including journalists and others, didn't get permissions until sometimes 24 hours before the hearing, less than 24 hours before the hearing, people found it very difficult to monitor. Unlike in the previous stages of Julian's hearings where remote access was permitted to be to journal, accredited journalists in Australia or America, this time around, at a very late stage, the judges said, we will give remote access, but only if you are actually in England or Wales. So you would expect that somebody sitting in Australia is the one who needs remote access, not somebody sitting in England and Wales because they can physically travel to the court. But, yeah. but in the interest of open justice, the judges opined that because their jurisdiction is England and Wales, uh, as it was in previous stages, right, they will only allow um, you to monitor the court if you're in the court, in the courtroom or within the jurisdiction of England and Wales, which is just bizarre. So there's a lot of people who would have been in court who typically in the past, in a, sp in a space where nobody covers the Assange hearings, gave it some airtime, all those people were excluded. And then when you came to court, there was there were two rooms, one in which um, and these were I, I checked afterwards as to the sizes of the different courtrooms. Court five in which this, these hearings were held when, was not certainly not one of the biggest courtrooms. They had arranged for court five and another courtroom, which was an overflow courtroom. And you would think between the two of them, it'd be great. But anybody who was in the overflow courtroom spent quite a lot of the time not being able to hear anything. And mm. 20 people who, who, of the various people who were on the web link, they couldn't hear anything either. So, so although you had all these people who supposedly had access, there wasn't much coverage. And you can see that in the quality of the coverage in the mainstream news. What, and of course, you know, the mainstream news is really rubbish at covering Assange. What's also really interesting is that the mainstream journalists, there were, a, there were a small number in the court on the first day, as far as I could see, and it's difficult to recognize somebody, but you see the ones with the press pass, really. But many of them only turned up in day two because they only were interested in what the US were arguing. And no. one particular one, and I won't name the person, actually turned up, then went off for a long lunch, and then turned up just for, to hear a little bit. And there were... A couple that I saw who were, I wouldn't say they were particularly paying attention to, because you can see it was such a small courtroom, you can see what people are up to. And Julian, for the first time in a long time, had been given permission to attend, but he was so unwell that he was unable to attend either in person or online. Now, that's quite worrying because a few weeks ago, Rebecca Vincent of Reporters Without Borders who had visited him in prison said that he appears to have broken a rib from excessive coughing because he had a um, some kind of chest infection. And I, I'm i aware that he's been unwell, so... Can I just check something? He hasn't been on hunger strike or done anything himself to make his health not up to what it normally is. Is it just a matter of him being neglected in, in prison or why, why, why would his health be better? Is it a psychological thing that he's, because he's incarcerated, it's kind of affected his health? Would so you know? So in 2022, Julian had, 2020, 2021, sorry. Julian had what is called a trans ischemic attack. 2021, was it? When was it? When we were in court for the high court. So that would have been 2022. He had a TIA or a mini stroke. So the long-term effects of torture on the body are not known. He's always had um, a lung condition and he has osteoporosis, which obviously doesn't get better being in prison 13 years in one way or another. The budget for prisoners 
uh, for their meals per day at prisons like Belmarsh is roughly about two pounds. So you can imagine the quality of the meals that people get. Craig's written about it extensively about how stodgy the food is. And you get this thing called, which is called, I think, uh, what do they call it? Prison bloat. And you kind of look more chubby and whatever else because you're eating really poor quality, stodgy food and you can't really make out what you're eating. Mm. So and there's no medical treatment he could get either. I mean, he's not going to get anything for his 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 osteoporosis or or other his stroke, and you know he's not going to get any. Um... Well, prison medical care is prison medical care. He's also, you know, if you've been tortured, mentally tortured and physically tortured for so long with all these conditions, and you're an innocent man, I'm sure it takes its toll on you. He's he's got depression. We know that both sides including the US agreed that he's got moderate to severe depression at the time when the hearings were. And it must be hard to, to I don't I don't know exactly what it was, but I do know that this time he was given access, but wasn't well enough to attend. So he yeah. couldn't make it. So that's, that's, that's really, that's not good at all. I mean, so what happened um, it, on the first day, the, uh, his lawyers spoke, uh, spoke there i mean what was that were, were they bringing up stuff that um that you thought impressed the judges could you tell if the judges were sort of thrown a bit by some of the stuff they were hearing the presence of so many ordinary citizens both in court and outside the court and the change in the mood from so many years ago based on work that people like you have done and people in who watch your show have done in terms of educating the community means that the judges are now much more aware that they're being watched. And unlike in the COVID times when Baretza could shut herself in a court and you didn't even have anything on the internet about her and you couldn't um, really, people didn't really know what was going on. There is a lot more attention given that all the major press freedom organizations, all the major trade un journalist unions, et cetera, have started to say you shouldn't be prosecuting this man. So the judges didn't do the obvious things of being arrogant and pretending not to listen, which they've done in the past. The things that we need to know from the first day is stuff that people are aware of, stuff like um, the lawyers have been spied upon. You can, that there is a political opinion exception within not just the political offense, exception within the extradition treaty between the US and the UK, within the extradition act itself, there is a political opinion exception. And one of the things that the lawyers spent a lot of time arguing was that it's really important that the war crimes that Julian revealed and their impact on politics be understood. The presentation that Julian made in front of the UN and others were really critical so, for example, the, the the Iraq war ended because of the cable that Philip Alston had sent showing that um, the Americans were involved in an extrajudicial killing in Iraq of an entire village of people almost. And this entire family in this quite a large family, including uh, very young children. And that led... Julian's disclosure of that, uh, or rather Chelsea's disclosure and Julian's publication of that, led to the U Iraqi government taking away immunity for American soldiers for these war crimes. Because the reason Americans could commit these war crimes was because the Iraqi government were give giving them immunity. And the fact that that immunity was removed helped to make the Americans pull back to, and end the Iraq war. How political is that? How important is that in affecting um, the reality of politics on the ground? Similarly, the case of Khalid al-Masri, the man who was abducted, tortured, um, and then they found out they already had a Khalid al-Masri in custody. <laughs> you know, it's just bizarre. Mm. And so these kinds of things, his lawyers argued, was a clear indication that this was, Julian had a political opinion, and so he was eligible for the exception. They also talked about the fact that once Julian goes to the US, 
the charges can be reformulated such that Julian is now exposed to the death penalty. Now, this is really important because on the one hand, he has the death penalty, and I think people will make a lot of it given that we have a, a, a large body of legal stuff to say we shouldn't be extraditing people to death penalty countries. But on the other hand, were they to take the death penalty off the table through another so-called diplomatic assurance, what they're essentially going to do is put him in prison for the rest of his natural life. In a prison where, when you're moved, firstly, your cell is an eight by six, 12 by 8 cell, concrete, made of concrete blocks, one small window which doesn't directly look into the, the, the sunlight or whatever, your everything in the room is pretty much fixed to the ground. You are given your food through a hatch in the door. You're in your cell 23 hours a day, mainly. And you can communicate from one cell to another through the drains and drive yourself mad trying to find another human being to talk to. So that's what he faces pre-trial. And if you're moved from one cell to another, or if you want to go to the library, for example, you're moved in something called a three-person hold, which means you're shackled, manacled, and then three people have to be available to move you from one place to another, which means people are not often moved from one place to another. So these are the things he is facing in the US. And the US's diplomatic assurances do nothing to, to address the fact that they will actually not do that to him. And the people deciding the conditions of his imprisonment in conjunction with the Bureau of Prisons. So let's say the judge says, as they did in John Kiriakou's case, he can be in an open prison, right? The Bureau of Prisons in the US does not have to take account of that. As they did in John Kiriakou's case, they can put him in a, in a maximum security prison because they believe that's what, because they are in charge of the prison estate and mm -hmm. they decide where he's held. And the people deciding um, what conditions he's under is a team of various agencies, including the CIA. And you know the CIA, and this was discussed in court quite a lot, plotted to assassinate him. So they intended to either poison him or kidnap him on the streets of Knightsbridge. So this, and we also know that the attempt to assassinate him was discussed at the level of Donald Trump. So all of this means that, and of course, in the UK, we have our friend, um, the former, what's his name, Alan Duncan, in his memoirs admitting he helped to broker a deal between Ecuador and America. This included, in the background, of course, an IMF loan to Ecuador mm. um, in order to firstly, when Ecuador kicked Julian out of the embassy, they handed over his entire legal strategy to the Americans. So if you if your entire legal strategy is with the Americans, if while you were in the embassy for a long period of time, your conversations with your lawyers were surveilled and the US has those tapes and the US's argument at earlier stage was, hey, the guys who are going to prosecute him in the US cannot use that evidence in court because it was obtained illegally. What? Mm. You know, so this is... This is just completely bizarre. So all these things were talked about. They talked about the diplomatic assurances. They talked about the death penalty, which was quite depressing. And um, they talked about the fact that Julian's journalism was this an example of the political opinion exception. So, yeah. so, uh, so we heard we've had the case of the. The Julian's lawyers on day one. So what what happened on day two? Because I mean that's that's where a lot of interest is on in this case. What what did the US say? What did their lawyers say? So the US, I mean, it was bizarre their arguments on day two, but it were they were arguments that the that again the judges were listening closely closely to. Number one, they were arguing that Chelsea Manning wasn't a whistleblower; she was a thief. Okay. So if Chelsea Manning isn't a whistleblower, then Julian isn't a, isn't a journalist. He's just an accomplice of a thief who has incited her to steal something from the government, the US government. And secondly, they were arguing that Julian's publications showed irresponsibility and showed that he put 
people's informants' lives at risk. And Julian's lawyers, of course, made the point that, hey, how have you managed to speak for two and a half hours without ever mentioning the war crimes that the US committed? And secondly, how have how have you managed to say, firstly, that Chelsea is not a whistleblower? And secondly, here's somebody who has all these journalism awards, all this um, clear indication that he's done public interest journalism, and he has revealed these war crimes of, which show the murder, torture, displacement of thousands and thousands, not thousands, millions of people. And so that is definitely uh, the act of somebody engaging in public interest journalism. He's not done it for money. He's done it purely for these reasons. The other um, important thing he, they were trying to point out, the Americans on day two, was Julian's not eligible because of him being a thief, him not being a real journalist. So they were saying, hey, guys, Guardian, New York Times, don't worry, because he's not really a journalist. We won't come after journalists for this. And this is not a politically motivated prosecution, because both Trump and Biden administrations have continued to prosecute Julian. So the fact that both a Republican and a Democrat administration have continued to prosecute him shows that this is not a politically motivated prosecution at all. And Julian's just pretending that this is politically motivated so that he can take advantage of all the protections at the European Court of Human Rights stages. Those were the some of the main arguments that were made. And it was just surreal sitting in court, hearing these people referring to the most important whistleblower of our times, Chelsea Manning, who like Edward Snowden, you know, has really allowed us to understand the real harm that took place. And weigh, and they were trying to weigh it up against this potential harm that could have taken place to people who were actually criminals <laughs> and pretend that somehow it's equivalent. Not only that it's equivalent that these war crimes didn't exist, but the fact that Julian's revelations may have uh, undermined US foreign policy decisions, et cetera, is harmful. And so Julian should be sent to the US and be punished for this, and that he will get a fair trial in the US. But we cannot assure you that he will not get the death penalty. They said that. In effect, yeah. Wow. So they cannot provide any assurances, uh, and they haven't yet. And this, the government legal services lawyer had to confess this when the judge asked him directly um, in relation to the Secretary of State's decision. It, he said it would be very difficult to provide any assurances that the death penalty is com completely off the table. It was the, the straight-facedness of the CPS lawyer in the way she was, you know, she was... She was just completely blasé about saying these things. That's what shocked me more, the banality of it all, the way in which it was, oh, he's not really a journalist. Don't worry about what happens to him because what, what we do to him won't be done to any real journalist. In Julian's case, what's really astonishing is the fact that they don't consider him a journalist. Um, and they're trying to, they were trying to do a lot to say he was a hacker. Now, Julian, could, although he was a hacker in his younger days, he didn't need to hack to get the information that he published because Chelsea Manning already had security clearance for that information. So there was no need to hack. Secondly, yeah. there was plenty of evidence given at the Old Bailey to show that it was the media partners like The Guardian and others who wanted to go ahead with the publication without the redaction and were pushing WikiLeaks and it was Julian who spent, while the others partied, he spent night after night through his fantastic IT skills, clearing out the names of the people. He even contacted when, you know how the names came out? Let me tell you the story. The names came out because two journalists, they, they published a book. And when Julian gave people passwords to the databases which contained the information, he gave them a very, very long password key, half of which was said orally, half of which was written down. And so it was very difficult to, for anyone. You know, this was very sophisticated encryption. So you could never get this information out. These guys actually published, and this guy, 
the guy who wrote this book, one of them is the brother-in-law, I think, of Alan Rusbridger. And he, uh, they published as the title of the chapter, The Password. And Julian and others had, um, Julian had published the information on WikiLeaks, um, had held the information on WikiLeaks. They had mirror sites at other places which had the information but you couldn't get into those mirrors, into the underlying data, unless you had the password. And these guys publishing it with the password, when they published it, then that's when the information was cracked by the organizations. So when the information came out, it was Julian who was ringing. He knew it was going to come out. So he rang through to Hillary Clinton's office and said to them, hey, this information has come out, do you want to do anything about it? And they didn't. In fact, to this day, the information is still on the web on an organization called Crypto, right? And that is an American organization. And their CEO, their founder, John Young, has confirmed that the US has never asked him to take it down. Wow. Never. This is an American organization. Wow. They could easily shut it down. So they don't really care about informants' lives at risk, right? They didn't, when Hillary Clinton's team were informed of this, they didn't do anything to protect people if they really, as though they really cared. But in court, what they were arguing is, oh, it was Julian who put people's lives at risk, which is completely untrue. Right. So, so what's the, what's the, what was the end result of this? I mean, you say it, there's, we're not going to hear anything till March, but what, what paperwork, what evidence, written evidence do they want? There's no more written evidence. They just want some clarifications on a couple of points, which Julian's lawyers and the other lawyers are going to submit in writing because they explain something in court which they haven't, which the judges asked. And that's so. This is not. It's you're not expecting new evidence or new materials to be introduced at this stage. Just some written submissions and on stuff that has already been covered within the paperwork. And so then, will they inform you or or Julian's team? I mean, not I mean, not you, but Julian's lawyers of when this. Uh, decisions made and will that be in court or will it be a written decision to them so what they usually do is they inform the lawyers a, a day in advance of when the uh, decision is made so they, it, the lawyers will know a rough timeline but the day before you they will be given the copy and then in court it will be handed down to everybody so um, the, now I just want to highlight a couple of things the next stage is that if Julian is not given any grounds of appeal, so he could get zero grounds of appeal, one or two grounds of appeal, or all his grounds of appeal. If he gets zero grounds of appeal, the next stage is potentially to put him on a plane to the US. The only bar to that is if the European Court of Human Rights, with its what they call pajama judges who intervene very quickly, like they did in the Rwanda case, come in with an interim order under Rule 39 to say, hey, we're going to look at this case and you need to um, hold off. And they've that's only, I believe, been done once recently in a case of this kind of stuff. So that's a potential avenue that Julian has if, if they put in a Rule 39. And if the UK, of course, respects it, which the, we would expect them to because they are signed up to the... And then, or they say, no grounds to appeal, off you go to the United States. Or they say, one or two grounds of appeal, come back to us in three or six months, whatever it is, and we hear have a hearing again. Or they say, all grounds. Now, if I was Joe Biden and you know being hammered on Gaza, all that, but also part of an administration that is completely shameless, uh, both those things need to be kept in mind. Uh, you would not want to uh, have Julian on your soil yet. So you might just say, okay, we'll have one or two grounds and can agree with the UK and the establishment, assuming that the, if you assume that the judges can be molded in that way. So mm. I expect that he may continue in the system, but we don't know. You know, these judges might be what the, some of, some people have said to me that these are, judges who are highly respected and highly intelligent and let's see if they show any independence of the British judiciary 